Well, good evening, friends from the East Coast, and good afternoon if you're on the West Coast. Uh, I want to just say, first of all, I'm Jim Kaysen again from the Friends Committee on National Legislation, and we are at the Quaker Public Policy Institute and Lobby Day. And this is one of my favorite days. We, this is the day when all of you were virtually on Capitol Hill lobbying your members of Congress. And I hope that if you're watching on YouTube, you'll share a little bit about how those lobby visits went. Tell us something about what was a highlight from your visit. Tell us uh, what surprised you. And then we're going to hear a little bit later from some of our 11-month program assistants. And Diane is also going to present the Edward Snyder Award for Peace. And I believe she's also got a couple of guests who've asked to speak to you, but I'm going to let her talk about that a little bit later. But first... As we get started, as we have done, as we did yesterday anyway, we've got another short video here of people in Washington and people around the country that are joining us for this virtual gathering as we come together to both do the work of our lobbying and also to be together as a community. Good morning, my name is Clarence Edwards and I'm the Legislative Director for Sustainable Energy and Environment here at FCNL. Joining you this morning on a beautiful, beautiful morning here in Washington, D.C. And this message is to, to just welcome you to the annual meeting and to thank you um, for your support uh, for FCNL over this past year and over the past many years. Welcome to Washington, D.C. We look forward to uh, you joining us. Good morning, I'm Rosalie Reitz, PA for Sustainable Energy and Environment, and I'm in D.C. tuning in in front of the Supreme Court building. Thank you guys so much for joining us at annual meeting. Hi everyone, I'm Tim and I'm from Dayton, Ohio, and I'm the Advocacy Teams Trainer at FCNL, and I'm here with a future Advocacy Teams member, and I'm so grateful for your advocacy and support, thank you. Everyone, I'm Tom Krugoff, I'm here at the waterfront in Tacoma, Washington, where the Puyallup tribe of Indians still lives and cares for the land and water. Greetings from Tacoma Friends Meeting. Hi, I'm Bobby Trice, the Quaker Outreach Coordinator for FCNL out in Falls Church, Virginia. This is Bandit, and we are excited to welcome you to Annual Meeting 2021. Well, thank you, friends, for helping us come together as a community. And now I'm going to turn things over to Diane Randall, our general secretary. Well, thanks, Jim. Um, great to be with you. And I am really looking forward to the next hour of programming that we have here for you this evening, because as Jim said, we're going to get to hear your stories about how lobbying went. I heard a couple of stories today when I was in a lobbyist meeting, and I got to hear a story talking to Pam and Ron Ferguson, who are part of the Indiana delegation. Ron is a clerk of our general committee. So I, it's, it's always great to hear how, how it goes when you sit down with a congressional office, uh, either with the staffers, and sometimes we've gotten members to participate. Now, Justin has been keeping us informed of how many lobby visits were scheduled. So Jim, I'm really keen on not only hearing a few of the great stories that we've had, but also give us some numbers about um, how many people went in, how many visits we had, and then let's hear what they heard or what happened as they did these virtual lobby visits. Sure, Diane, and uh, the, the, the work is incredible. Justin tells us that we've already had 200 separate lobby visits with members of Congress in 43 states. We've, we've covered over 80% of the entire Senate already in these visits that you've done. And the, and the reports are still coming in. I'll come back to that a little bit later. It is just astonishing to me the commitment that you all have to make change in Washington. And Justin Hurdle, who Diane referred to, who works, by the way, with Claire Carter, scheduled most of these appointments. And when I asked him about this today, he's, he said, he, I thought he summed it up pretty well. He said, you know, from Alaska to Florida, from Maine to Hawaii, we've been into the offices of our senators and our representatives. Whether you were one person like Susan Wilson, who met with her rep 
Anthony Delgado from New York. And then her rep was so pleased that he's already tweeted out a photo of the meeting. Are you with a California delegation that had 40 plus people in a Zoom room? Your commitment to helping move this legislation forward is just so heartwarming. And you don't have to believe me because I've been talking to some of the congressional staff who are just overwhelmed by that. I had several people literally sort of mouths open. 200 lobby visits today, right as the House is voting. I've asked our producer to share a slide with photos from one, just a few of the visits that you've already been on. But I hope you'll keep sending us in those screenshots because we'd love to put them together in a slideshow that we can share with each other and, and also share with some congressional offices. On one visit I joined today, the legislative director for a key Democratic congressman who is chair of one of the main committees involved with this bill, thanked our FCNL advocates for sharing their stories about working uh, in the district. The particular person he, that was meeting with this legislative director is a social worker. And he talked about seeing the impact of these payments that come in the middle of the month. The 15th of the month tends to be a time of relief for families now, the social worker explained. The legislative director said hearing how this is impacting the district is the most important thing that he can hear. So important for the congressman and so important for the work they're doing. On hearing that all of you were here today, he said he could not think of anything more important to do today. An hour ago, I read another report with the key tax aid of one of the Democrats who has still not said whether they are going to support the full bill that will go to the Senate. But the staffer said the Senator is supporting extending the expansion of the child tax credit. And when the FCNL group asked what they could do to help the Senator support the full bill, the staffer said, these stories and this conversation are extremely helpful. All of these visits are important. You are meeting with some of the folks who will ultimately decide this. Today, our own Nicole Santos joined a delegation from the area where she grew up that met with Representative Neal's key staff aide. This is literally, Representative Neal is literally one of the two or three people in the House who will be negotiating the final bill, even when it goes to the Senate and it comes back to the House. And the two other things I just note is that we're supporting each other. The FCNL folks from Connecticut specifically asked Justin to know when the folks from West Virginia and Arizona were going to be on lobby visits so they could hold those delegations in the light. That's what we do. I do believe that our Quaker approach to lobbying allows us to do many things that are important and some that are not as common as some other groups. In two reports I received today, I read of visits with Republican Senate offices. In both those reports, the staff said the senator they represent supports the expanded child tax credit and earned income tax credit being continued. You remember, Amelia told us that there were a lot of Republican offices that support uh, this, these measures. And while these senators are not going to vote for the Build Back Better bill, they did say they want to see these programs continued and would be working to do that. Creating that kind of political space, that's part of what we do as well. We talk and we listen actively to everyone. Two appeals then to all of you, and then I'm going to hand it back to Diane. In one of the lobby visits that you all went on, our FCNL group also heard a warning that maybe this legislation will not pass this year. That even if the House acts, the Senate might stall on this until next year. I want to remind all of us of what it of what Amelia told us yesterday. The last checks go out to families, the last checks of this expanded child tax credit go out to families December 15th. If this legislation is not passed before the end of the year, there are millions of families that will lose those extended benefits. They will not get those checks in January. We can't let that happen. So even when you go home, I hope you will stay in touch with your senator's offices on this issue. And here's the second thing. We're gonna be continuing to lobby here in Washington as well. 
And Amelia and Abby in particular are, are already making plans to follow up on your visits. But to do that, we need your reports on those visits. So please don't delay. If you were the note taker, go to fcnl.org slash report back and send in the report on your lobby visit tonight. Thanks and back to you, Diane. Great, thank you, Jim, for sharing those really uplifting stories. I want to underscore what Jim said about the power of your lobby and the collective power of having so many people showing up in virtual visits. Believe me, this gets noticed. This gets noticed by the members who visited directly, but it also gets noticed by others because the staffers talk to each other. You know, did you talk to somebody from the Friends Committee and were they talking to you about the child tax credit? So this constancy is really an important feature of our, of our work and I thank you. And I just wanna also underscore getting the reports in and also thinking about how to extend this conversation as you go back home to your local districts. You know, having worked on um, homelessness issues before and having worked with people who were poor, I do know that this time of the year, Thanksgiving and Christmas are the time we start to see media stories about people in need. So it's a perfect opportunity to reach out with a letter to the editor, for example, and talk about how we can actually make a difference by extending the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit. So think about that, and we'd be happy to help you if you have some have some questions about how to how to keep the lobbying going over the next couple of weeks. We're going to change gears a little bit now, and this has always been one of the favorite times of FCNL's annual meeting was to hear from our program assistants, and we're going to do this in two different segments. So tonight is the first segment where you will hear from uh, several of our program assistants, as well as from Asma, who is a Scoville fellow who is working with us for this year. Scoville Fellowship is a separate kind of program that we've been able to have benefits from. And so we're thrilled to be able to include Asma in this as well. I just want to say that uh, this is a, a great group of people. They Right now, some of them are working in the office, some of them are working remotely, and they're all working very diligently as usual. And so we're very, very pleased to, to present the, their stories, uh, having them speak to you. This is going to run about 18 minutes, and then we're going to come back with some other features of tonight's program, which includes giving an award and a special speaker. Hi, everyone. My name is Rafi. I am the program assistant for Peace Building. As a Latina born in the United States, aching to be fully fluent in English and Spanish, I have done a lot of translating in my life. The easy, unconscious kind water, agua, frío, cold, the not so easy kind, Rafaela, Rafi, Rafaela, Rafaela. However, in the last couple of years, I began to notice where translations seemed to go wrong, or even worse, where they didn't even appear to occur. I witnessed moments where knowledge was rejected before it was even heard. So when I finally began to learn about the vastness and complexity of indigenous knowledge, a world of knowledge that had been erased, condemned and delegitimized for centuries, I listened closely. I embraced the feeling of naivete and explored lens after lens of how to see the world in a range of classes throughout college. I was lucky enough to work under the first ever indigenous governor in Ecuador and learned how his perspective and the perspectives of many indigenous communities internationally can be pivotal to evolving national policy. By the time I was a junior at Amherst College, I understood that each and every one of us has our own knowledge system made up of our cultural understandings, unique experiences, and our own understanding of the world. However, this often led us to mistranslation because our unique perspectives could allow us to see and observe the same exact thing, but lead us to different truths. So I wondered, how do we share those truths with one another and how do we listen? Ultimately, what I really wanted to know was how effectively our government could hear, understand, translate, and solve the problems marginalized communities face. So I spent a summer and then my senior year asking the question, how do indigenous concerns, perspectives, and knowledge 
get translated into legislation. I used the reauthorization process of VAWA 2013 as a case study. I interviewed Indigenous advocates and dove deep into the complex and contradictory world of Indigenous legal history. It allowed me to hear and understand the true weight of their powerful and heartbreaking stories. Indigenous advocates shared the uphill battles they faced trying to get Congress to hear their stories, see them on the most basic human level, and ultimately translate their experiences to Congress. I wanted to be a part of the translating, to build space for context, room for differences, and more bridges between opposing truths. More than anything, I wanted to understand where there was space for the voices of underrepresented, marginalized communities to be shared, how they navigated it, and how our government could better value the knowledge of these communities. So when I learned about FCNL and the kind of role I could have, I was sold. I learned about how FCNL values the voices of local actors and amplifies them so that Congress can truly understand what must be done to help these communities. I saw how this role was one of many here that is committed to doing the valuable work of translation. I saw the invaluable opportunity to finally be able to understand not only how this world of policy works, but I could be a part of making the most accurate translations from social problem to policy solution. Now I'm doing the real life work of building peace, one lobby meeting, letter or bill at a time alongside my supervisor, Ursula. We translate to Hill staffers why issues they may have never heard of or been impacted by, like a 25% cap on U.S. contributions to UN peacekeeping, have real and severe consequences for people around the world. We translate Quaker concerns for peace and human rights into legislative action. And most importantly, we listen and uplift the voices of those most impacted. We follow the guidance of those who face the problem, the people most qualified to provide insight into understanding and translating an issue. I could not be more grateful to have found this job in this community. I'm learning every day what it feels like to come closer to your purpose and to do good work with good friends at FCNL. Hello, everyone. My name is Istra Berman, and I am the Program Assistant for Nuclear Disarmament and Pentagon Spending. Growing up in Denton, Texas, I lived above our country's largest natural gas reservoir, and I was surrounded by extractive industries engaged in hydraulic fracturing or fracking. When I was 16, I began to notice how many people around me were contracting cancer from the toxins used in the fracking process. I spent a year raising awareness about the danger we faced, and I was thrilled when my city became the first in Texas to ban fracking by an overwhelming Democratic vote. News of our victory was covered across the globe, but the Texas state legislature quickly swooped in to overrule our fracking ban and any future local ban. Experiencing this first legislative disappointment at a young age helped harden my shell to experience many, many more in the work I've done since. While you might think I'm here to talk about policy disappointments, I actually want to focus on the power we have in leveraging young people's voices on the issues that matter to us. Young activists played an instrumental role in my hometown's decision to ban fracking. Similarly, we have an opportunity to change the conversation on nuclear weapons and militarization. But how do young people become passionate about this work, which we might think of as Cold War history? I can only tell my own story of how I found myself here at FCNL. When I graduated from Swarthmore College, I went straight into direct service work through the Quaker Voluntary Service. I worked with incarcerated women who had experienced domestic violence in order to pair them with lawyers and eventually get them paroled from prison. However, once out of prison, women still faced barriers to finding work and housing and community. Partly because I kept running up against these system-wide obstacles, I left direct service and joined FCNL's Advocacy Corps last year to organize for macro-level policy change. I lobbied for a pathway to citizenship for undocumented people, 
since we know that immigration status can be weaponized against people for power and control, as we say in the domestic violence field. When I was invited to apply for my current nuclear policy position, I found tremendous overlap with my existing passions for social justice and ending gender-based violence. In the nuclear disarmament field too, it is indigenous people, immigrants, women, and people of color who are disproportionately impacted by previous U.S. nuclear weapons tests. And they're also the ones most vocally speaking out against nuclear injustice. For instance, in my first lobby visit this year, I partnered with local Texas frontline community members who survived cancer after they were exposed to radiation from America's first nuclear tests. Some downwinders, as they're called, received compensation from the government, but many did not. The entire state of New Mexico, notably the site of the first ever atomic bomb test, was excluded from compensation, even though thousands of mostly native and Hispanic residents were exposed to radioactive fallout. Advocating for compensation for atomic survivors is a pressing issue at the intersection of immigration and racial justice, demilitarization work, and veterans' rights. Anti-Asian hate is also unfortunately embedded in our country's nuclear thinking. Back in 1945, there was a reason the U.S. targeted innocent people in Japan with nuclear bombs, and not people in Germany or Italy. Americans dehumanized Japanese people, and our country shamefully forced hundreds of thousands of Japanese Americans into internment camps. Today, I believe we see echoes of that racism in the Sinophobia, anti-Chinese prejudice, spurring on a nuclear arms race. America sees itself and France and the UK as responsible stewards of world-ending weapons. Meanwhile, China possesses only about 6% of our nuclear arsenal, but I regularly hear rhetoric painting the Chinese as impossible to figure out, mysterious, untrustworthy, and threatening. The truth is that these weapons are not safe in anyone's hands. Research shows that 75% of Americans believe nuclear weapons are a danger to the world, but far fewer believe they can do anything about it. Our job then is not just to alert people to the nuclear threat. We also have to empower them to change the status quo. A story that comes to mind is the first time I ever lobbied at FCNL's spring lobby weekend in 2020. When we broke out into state delegation groups, I found I would be lobbying with a class of 11 and 12 year olds from a local Quaker school. We were teaming up to ask our Senator to act on climate change. The teacher seemed a little embarrassed by the children being children, tripping over their words or forgetting how to use Zoom or breaking into giggles. But I thought their youthful voices were the most powerful in the room talking about their concerns for their future. They instantly seized attention that can start wandering when an adult lobbyist is speaking from a professional mindset. In the same way, young people have an especially powerful voice now talking about our vision of a nuclear-free future. My generation and the generations that follow are not tied to the Cold War mentality the way many in power still are. FCNL has written about the problem of all white men rubber stamping the nuclear status quo, as we saw in a Senate Armed Services vote earlier this year. Decisions about the fate of our world and the fate of future generations should not be made without our input. During the Cold War, the musician Sting criticized the mindset of mutual assured destruction with the simple lyric, I hope the Russians love their children too. These words remind me of the Quaker beliefs I hold, that we all have a shared humanity and a duty of stewardship. We must build a world together that can sustain and do right by our future generations. And we can do this by uplifting and fostering new, young voices who are changing the nuclear conversation. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Esma Rasen. I'm a Scoble Fellow at the Friends Committee on National Legislation and Education Fund. I work with the peace building team and support the coordination efforts of the Prevention and Protection Working Group, better known as PPWG. 
I would love to share a little about my personal journey and how I ended up at FCNL. In August 2014, life as I knew it changed. It was the day I said goodbye to my parents, my siblings, and the city where I was born and raised, Al Hudaydah, and my country, Yemen. I came to the US as an exchange student through the Kennedy Luger Youth Exchange and Study Program. This was my senior year in high school. I was supposed to be in the US for only 10 months and return to Yemen. However, the war in Yemen started three months before my scheduled return date. Under the guidance of the US State Department, I remained in America because the security situation in Yemen took a bad turn. It has been seven years now and I have not been able to visit Yemen. Due to the tragic and painful experience of watching my family and Yemenis suffer, I developed a deep desire for peace in my country and empathy for other nations undergoing war and humanitarian crises. My interest and passion for peace and conflict resolution inspired my education in international studies with a focus on international social justice. After being selected, by the Herbert Scoville Junior Peace Fellowship, I chose to work at FCNL because I wanted to be part of the peace building team as they advocate to reduce violent conflict and propose holistic solutions for ending war. I was also attracted to FCNL because of its work and advocacy on Yemen. Over the course of the last several months, I have been supporting PPWG's work I have learned firsthand how experts come together in a coalition and collectively push for real policy change with the administration and the Hill. I have learned about many other countries where populations face similar hardships during insecurity, violence, and humanitarian catastrophes. Most of all, I learned how civil society unites in Washington, D.C. to work on improving U.S. government mechanisms in peace building. I also learned how difficult it is for advocates and how committed they have to be to their long-term vision to sustain the many disappointments in policy work until they realize their hope for peace in different parts of the world. I worked very closely on the Ethiopia conflict and got to interact with country experts that were briefing the administration and the Hill in attempts to de-escalate the unfortunate security crisis in Ethiopia. They provided great input into the Ethiopia country assessment I was updating for PPWG, which was submitted to the Atrocity Early Warning Task Force. It has been a privilege to meet and speak with multiple experts on Ethiopia, as well as attend briefings where experts propose solutions to de-escalate the conflict and prevent harm to the population. I also learned a lot by briefly supporting the Middle East policy team. I had the opportunity to directly advocate for ending the ongoing blockade on Yemen and support educational efforts in urging Congress to end U.S. complicity in the war. My professional experience at FCNL has taught me the intricate complexities of U.S. foreign policy. Nevertheless, it has also highlighted the great need for advocates that work on peace building around the world and the importance of coalitions that lead this work. While there is much work to be done in improving the U.S. government's mechanisms to build peace, two, two key legislations have laid the foundation. The passage of the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act and the Global Fragility Act have paved the way, and implementation efforts continue to challenge the status quo in Washington. It has been a real honor to serve as a member of the peace community in DC. I have learned what it takes 
to advocate for prevention of violent conflicts and help save and protect innocent lives around the world. Truly, it is when advocates come together, whether in Washington or Yemen, they directly influence positive change. Though the road may be full of obstacles, the journey is worth uplifting humanity. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my story and much gratitude to you for supporting the work we do at FCNL. Thank you very much. Welcome back from those program assistant uh, remarks. And now we have two very special guests joining us from the White House. I'm going to introduce our first guest, who's going to introduce our second guest. And um, I'm, we're thrilled that uh, Josh Dixon is here with us. Josh is the deputy director of the Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships Office. He's also a senior advisor for public engagement. And I can tell you that uh, FCNL has truly appreciated working with Josh. He has been a great friend to us as we work on not just the Build Back Better bill, but in all of the initiatives that we work on. And particularly, he's worked very closely with Amelia Keegan and her work with many of the uh, organizations that, um, faith-based organizations that, that we work with. Uh, I didn't know this until I just read it, but Josh is also a long distance runner. Um, uh, like our own Amelia Keegan. So I'm sure in addition to all the uh, great issues that we work on with the White House, um, this is another one. I just wanna say how much difference it makes for us as an advocacy organization to have colleagues in this administration who want to know what we think, who want to engage with us, who ask us uh, to participate and who are willing to participate with us. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Josh who can introduce Erica. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Diane. And, uh, you know, as we say, um, uh, endurance uh, breeds perseverance, um, which is really important uh, for a lot of um, components of life, uh, including both running the physical races and uh, uh, working on these longer um, efforts that feel like races, uh, like getting bills passed and implemented and working um, to combat COVID-19 and so many other things that we have been so grateful to partner with FCNL on. So thank you for your leadership. A, a huge thank you to Amelia and to um, Jim and Annie uh, and Rob and so many others who are a part of the team. We are just so deeply value our partnership and collaboration with FCNL. As I mentioned, we are in this really historic moment right now, which um, our next guest, Erica, is going to speak to. Uh, and we could even see history made tonight. Uh, and so we're a very expectant in this incredibly important moment. Um, so without further ado, I am very thrilled to introduce someone um, who I look up to in so many ways. Uh, she is a phenomenal leader, uh, someone who is values driven and, and very much embodies the spirit of everything that FCNL stands for and fights for. Um, Erica Moritsugu uh, serves as the White House Deputy Assistant to the President and also serves as senior liaison to the uh, Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities. Um, previously, Erica has served as the Assistant Secretary for Congressional and Intergovernmental Relations at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, she's also led the Government Relations Advocacy and Community Engagement Team at the Anti-Defamation League, where she managed inter-religious engagements in support of the domestic civil rights mission there. Um, Prior to that, she served in senior roles with Senator Tammy Duckworth, with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, with Senator Daniel Keokaka of Hawaii, with the Senate Democratic Policy Committee under the leadership of Senator Harry Reid of Nevada, and with the White House Office of Presidential Personnel. So we're really talking to um, someone who just has such a lifelong career commitment to public service um, and uh, has, has really been a servant leader in so many respects. So with, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Erica um, uh, to uh, say hello on behalf of the administration and just share a little bit about why this moment is so important for us and how, why we're so excited to be in this work together with FCNL. Erica. Thank you, Josh, for that very generous introduction, my fellow servant leader. And thank you to FCNL for inviting me and the Biden-Harris administration to participate in your 2021 annual meeting. I want to begin with a note of gratitude to Diane Randall for her purposeful and prophetic leadership during these difficult times. Diane, 
you have modeled grace, resilience, and a commitment to the values that make us who we are when we are at our best. You've also been an incredible partner in our collective pursuit of the common good. And for that, we are and will always be grateful. I also want to give a special thanks to Amelia Keegan. Amelia, your relentless dedication to serving people and families in need inspires so many of us. You're a true coalition builder and a servant leader, and everyone at the White House is deeply appreciative for all you do. And I want to thank all of you for joining today and your commitment to making your voices heard. We are in unprecedented times, which also presents us with unprecedented opportunity. FCNL has already been a strong partner in the battle against COVID and the push for equity, economic opportunity, climate justice, and more. What you do as grassroots leaders really matters. It's a big reason we passed the American Rescue Plan, which provided direct payments to vulnerable kids and families, expanded and increased the amount of reach of the child tax credit, provided emergency rental assistance to people facing eviction, bolstered our efforts to get people vaccinated and boosted small businesses around the country. You're also a big reason we passed the investment in the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Deal. This is gonna rebuild America's roads, bridges and rails, expand access to clean drinking water, ensure everyone um, in America has access to high speed internet, tackle the climate crisis, advance environmental justice, and invest in communities that have too often been left behind. FCNL and faith-based organizations and partners have played a huge part in getting these new laws passed and ensuring that when they're implemented, they're done so in a way that centers equity and racial justice. At the signing of the infrastructure bill this past week, in fact, we're proud to have many religious leaders in attendance, including Diane, because of their integral role in getting it over the finish line. And we know we're not done yet. The President's Build Back Better agenda is the next critical piece to ensuring we make the most of the historic opportunity before us to address systemic injustices that have plagued vulnerable communities and communities of color for far too long. Build Back Better focuses on so many of the things we know will help lift families out of poverty and expand a child tax credit and earned income tax credit, increase funding for housing and answer hunger programs, child care and universal pre-K, expanded health care support, and more. It's truly a once-in-a-generation chance to restack the deck for the most vulnerable and move our country more in the direction of justice and opportunity for all. We're so grateful for FCNL's support and partnership on Build Back Better, and we want to encourage you to keep making your voices heard in every possible way. Speaking up and speaking out about how this bill will impact your communities, families, and congregations will make a difference and whether or not we get this done. And when we do get this bill passed, it will have an historic impact on the futures of millions of kids and families in a real and tangible way. I wanna close with a quote from Shirley Chisholm that is so resonant in this moment. She said, you don't make progress by standing on the sidelines, whimpering and complaining. You make progress by implementing ideas. Build Back Better is our chance to make our ideas, the things that we know work, a reality. It's our chance to make our mark on history and prove that despite the challenges and division and difficulties we face as a nation, we can do big things when we do them together. And we're so grateful for all that FCNL has done and continues to do in pursuit of this together. Thank you again for having me. And with that, I will turn it back to Diane. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, so much for those really encouraging, encouraging words. And thank you for your servant leadership. Thank you, Josh, for your servant leadership. It's pretty amazing to have people working in our White House who care about these issues that we care about so deeply and who are so dedicated to working day in, day out on assuring that children um, have what they need, that families, we are investing in families, that we're working on these issues from a racial equity perspective. Um, and yes, we are tremendously thrilled about the big infrastructure bill. It was thrilling to be at this, the uh, uh, signing ceremony. And I want to just lift up that, that one of the provisions that we so care about um, uh, is the investment in Native American communities. This is unprecedented and really a thrill in addition to all of the other investments that are in that bill. We will continue to work very hard on Build Back Better. 
not only from this office here at FCNL, but throughout the country with our advocates who join us today. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. All right, I'm gonna let Josh and Erica sign off with what great gratitude. We have even more in our program tonight, so I hope you'll stay with us. Um, we are going to now turn to the Ed Snyder Award. And as you know, uh, the Edward F. Snyder Award for National Legislative Leadership in Advancing Disarmament and Building Peace is an award we present annually and have done so for many years. It's given to an outstanding member of Congress who has displayed leadership in advancing legislative priorities consistent with those advocated for by the Friends Committee on National Legislation. This award's named after FCNL's second executive secretary, Ed Snyder, beloved to many of us who has now passed. Ed was a tireless advocate for nuclear disarmament and peace during the 35 years he worked for FCNL. This year, FCNL is giving our award to Indiana Senator Todd Young. Senator Young's work to end the endless war, prevent new wars and encourage diplomacy to reduce the suffering of those affected by violent conflict deserves recognition. To name just a few examples, Senator Young has been a strong advocate for reasserting Congress's constitutional responsibility to determine when our country goes to war or engages in violent conflict. He's worked carefully with senators in his own party and with Senator Tim Kaine on legislation that would repeal the 2002 Iraq authorization for use of military force so-called AUMF. We also appreciated his co-sponsorship in the last Congress of legislation to end US support for the Saudi-led war in Yemen, as well as a series of resolutions to disapprove of arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Last year, Senator Young cast a key vote in support of legislation to prevent an authorized war with Iran. He has also been a key voice to point out the importance of extending the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty the landmark uh, treaty between the US and Russia that limits the number of deployed nuclear weapons in our two countries. And we are grateful that ha that has been extended. Senator Young is not with us, of course, here, but we do have a video of it and a video of his uh, welcoming of this. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just uh, ask, can we roll the video now? I'm honored to receive the Edward F. Snyder Award for National Legislative Leadership in Advancing Disarmament and Building Peace. The Friends Committee on National Legislation's commitment to peace is something that is important to me as a United States Senator. In August, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee passed my bill with Senator Tim Kaine to repeal the 1991 and 2002 AUMFs. Our bill will help prevent the future misuse of the Gulf and Iraq war authorizations and strengthen congressional oversight over war powers. This bill is essential to reasserting the role of Congress in critical matters of when and how to use military force. Congress must be at the table when the lives of men and women are in question, and Congress should do everything in its power to avoid military conflict and promote peaceful, strategic solutions. For instance, over the last two years, I've worked with Senator Chris Van Hollen on extending the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty with Russia, which is also known as New START. New START was originally championed in the Senate by former Senator Richard Lugar and has provided stability, predictability, and critical intelligence insights over more than 90% of the world's nuclear weapons and served as a means to keep Russia's nuclear weapons ambitions in check. The original New START treaty was signed in 2010 and was set to expire at the beginning of 2021. My work with Senator Van Hollen laid the groundwork for President Biden achieving a five-year extension of the treaty when he took office. My work built upon Senator Luger's calls for preserving crucial caps on nuclear capabilities and reducing the threat of nuclear war. In the U.S. Senate, I will continue the important work of leading on matters of national security through the means of diplomacy. Thank you for this honor.
Thank you uh, so much for that video, Senator Young. And thank you to our constituents in Indiana who met with Senator Young's office today and also actually met with the Senator. So we are grateful uh, to our friends in Indiana who have maintained a continuing and ongoing relationship with Senator Young and for his leadership in working with FCNL on these vital issues. Now, I think we have two more speeches from our current class of program assistants that we're gonna share. But don't leave yet, because after those, we have one more thing we want to share with you. So stick with us for a little bit more and look forward to these next two videos. Hello, everyone. My name is Emma Holbert, and I'm the program assistant for Quaker Outreach at FCNL. I can't talk about my journey to political advocacy and social justice work without talking about my Quaker faith. Growing up, my father took me to first day school every Sunday for as long as I can remember. And as many of you probably know, you can hardly go more than five minutes in a Quaker meeting without hearing some mention of FCNL. So I have been aware of this organization my entire life. As a kid, I had a war is not the answer bumper sticker on my door and proudly told my friends that I was a pacifist since before I even understood what pacifism meant. Through my community and the Chapel Hill Friends meeting, I developed an understanding that my faith could not exist without the call to be active on issues of injustice. For me, acting for a better world and my Quaker identity have always gone hand in hand. Because of this, my political values, my passion for social justice, and my draw to Quaker faith are not separate threads of my identity that I can pull apart. They are intricately intertwined, supporting each other and allowing me to learn and grow in the world. A big part of the development of my Quaker identity came from my relationship with my grandmother. At the beginning of my program assistant year a few months ago, we were given FCNL note cards and were tasked with writing thank you notes to anyone who had supported and believed in us up to this point. Immediately, I thought of Grandma Jean, a lifelong Quaker who died two years ago while she was living with my family. I always felt particularly connected with her because of her love of politics and social change that was driven by her Quaker faith. She and my grandfather came to Quakerism as young adults. My grandfather was a conscientious objector, jumping into forest fires and parachutes, and my grandmother was very connected with FCNL throughout her life and adored this organization, which of course rubbed off on me. I never knew my grandpa, but Quakerism and politics were always the two things my grandmother and I connected over and I cherish those conversations I had with her. As I had always been aware of FCNL, as soon as I was old enough, I organized a group from my high school to attend a Spring Lobby Weekend here in DC. Before my first Spring Lobby Weekend, I knew I wanted to change the world like every overly ambitious teenager, but I didn't yet know how to turn my anger and sense of futility about the world into a productive channel. FCNL's Spring Lobby Weekend gave me that gift. I didn't really know what to expect, but I definitely did not expect to come away feeling absolutely invigorated, capable, and empowered to actually do something about the injustice I saw in the world. But that's exactly what happened. We were lobbying on mass incarceration and justice reform that year, and I realized that this was the work that I had been missing. This was the work I wanted to do. This was the kind of change I believed in. At my first Spring Lobby Weekend in 11th grade, I heard about the Young Fellows Program. It was exactly what I wanted to do, so I set my sights on this job then. And to get accepted into this organization whose mission I believe in six years later is absolutely a dream come true. Truly the reason I majored in political science and am interested in politics and social justice today is because of that spark that was lit by my Quaker meeting and fanned into a fire by FCNL that I get to work with this organization that has meant so much to me my entire life, and particularly the past few years, is everything to me. Grandma Jean always pushed me to live my faith into action through advocating for a better world. As cheesy as it sounds, being here with you all, working on the Quaker aspects of FCNL's work, feels like the continuation of a leading that has been in my family for generations, from my grandmother down to me. Upon receiving the email that I had been hired by FCNL, I was overwhelmed, thinking of how proud my grandmother would be of me and wishing that I could tell her. I'm honored to be spending this year with FCNL, using my Quaker values and identity to work towards change. Thank you.
Hello everyone, my name is Kat Deskamp-Renner and I'm the Program Assistant for Middle East Policy at FCNL. This summer, I found footage from my dad's handheld video camera from the weekend after 9-11. At two, I'm young enough that my sister still finds me adorable and fascinating, chattering next to me and poking my chubby cheeks and playing with my hair as my dad zooms in on my face. The next shot, my sister and I have disappeared into the other room to fetch some toys, and it's suddenly silent. And my dad pulls out that day's copy of The Oregonian with the headline, Bush, we're at war, and zooms out on it silently. Congress had passed a blank check for the use of military force on Friday. My sister and I come back into the room, toys in tow, and my dad ends the tape. When I saw that for the first time this summer, I felt like someone had plucked a string of twine I hadn't even known I'd been tied to for 20 years, anchored somewhere behind me and invisible until I felt it oscillate. I turned around and for a second I could see everywhere I'd been since then and how I'd gotten here. I don't remember that Tuesday in September and the earliest memory I have of the Iraq war or anything to do with foreign policy is my older sister exclaiming that we had captured Saddam Hussein, even though neither of us really knew what that meant. So in a way, it makes sense that I fell headfirst into Middle East policy based on those formative memories, not of 9-11, but of the government's response to it because of the way that response reverberated across the globe and across my own life. Around age 10, I developed a habit of swiping the latest copy of Newsweek from my dad's desk and reading them cover to cover. There was usually an article on something happening in the Middle East, and I was always most drawn to those, especially when the Iranian Green Movement and the Arab Spring began. That was before Occupy Wall Street, in a moment that felt increasingly dark and precarious to me. I'd watched my dad lose his job in the first round of mass layoffs from the Great Recession, watched for three years as the financial crisis continued to crush down on my family. I cried in the school supplies aisle at Target, I cried anywhere that cost my parents money, and to this day have never felt more powerless, have never felt smaller in the face of a bigger problem. Watching the Arab Spring was the first time I saw a mass political protest, and it made me feel like maybe I didn't have to be small and powerless, because here were other people taking control of their power. It made me want to learn about the countries those protests took place in, and why people were protesting, and what the U.S. had to do with it all. In college, every year when we came back from winter break, my friends in my Persian language class who had visited family in Iran over the break would mention how hard it was to get medicine there or how much food prices had gone up since the U.S. had withdrawn from the nuclear agreement. And every year it got worse until the year we spent the second half of winter break terrified we would go to war with Iran. I worked for three years in college at a job where I regularly talked with Yazidis in Iraq, an ethnic and religious minority group recovering from genocide committed by ISIS, which had emerged out of the chaos the U.S. carelessly sowed in the region, beginning the day we decided to go to war. Someone plucks a string on this side of the world, casts a vote, before I'm old enough to remember, and that string is still vibrating after all this time and causing ripple effects thousands of miles away. I spent most of my life watching the U.S. make its Middle East policy based on a series of imagined and inflated threats, supposedly in the name of protecting Americans. During the 20th anniversary of 9-11 this year, I read countless think pieces about how 9-11 changed the American psyche by demonstrating that we were no longer untouchable, by making us feel fundamentally insecure and unsafe. But if the dominating emotion of the last two decades has been precarity and fear, it is not because of 9-11, but because I watched the economy collapse and pull my family down with it, because I watched COVID ravage the country and kill 700,000 people, because every summer I watched my home state of Oregon go up in flames to the point where the wildfire smoke follows me to this side of the country. None of the things we did to supposedly protect ourselves from danger really protected us at all, but that's not what actually matters. What matters is that we've been inflicting incalculable harm on the people in the Middle East, people whose lives have meaning and value and who deserve to be on the receiving end of a foreign policy that doesn't disregard their humanity. My generation has to be the one to turn around and see the strings that are still oscillating and we have to cut them off. Thank you, Kat, Emma, Asma, Istra, and Rafi. Those were powerful speeches we heard this evening. And tomorrow you'll 
be able to hear more. So stay tuned for the next programming tomorrow. But before you leave tonight, we have a couple of other um, items we want to share with you. Yesterday, if you were with us, you know that we gave our Justice Award to Representative Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut, a person who had been uh, the, one, of the, one of the legislators who actually started the child tax credit uh, many years ago. And she is someone we truly wanted to honor. We didn't have the video in time, but we have it right now, and we're thrilled to show it to you. Thank you, Diane Randall, for those kind words and generous introduction. And for all your work as the General Secretary of the Friends Committee on National Legislation, advocating for peace and social justice, and being such a fierce proponent for citizen engagement that advances policies and practices to create a better society for all. Let me also recognize all the members of FCNL. Your support means so much to me. I am honored and humbled by your recognition and our work today. And I want you to know this means a great deal to me. I do not take this as a reward for what I have done before. I take it as a call to continue fighting to help make a difference in the lives of our children and all hardworking families across Connecticut and our country. This is a special honor because the FCNL Justice Award recognizes our shared efforts to bring an end to child poverty by making the critical investments that children and families need and deserve. I'm especially honored to fight alongside all of you to help continue to expand and improve the child tax credit, a groundbreaking and transformative policy. You have been such wonderful partners in this fight. Together, we have come a long way now we must pass the Build Back Better Act, which I believe ranks alongside the New Deal and Great Society in its impact. It delivers a once-in-a-generation investment in children, families, and caregivers. And finally, a scale of investment in combating climate change that cannot wait. This legislation expands and improves the child tax credit, the biggest cut in taxes for working families with children, a policy that I have been fighting for for nearly 20 years. I am proud that families with children under six receive $300 a month and children six through 17 receive $250 a month. It is a lifeline for the middle class and it lifts over 50% of children out of poverty. It allows us to emerge from the shadows of the pandemic. It is social security for children. And as you know, the Build Back Better Act adds to this with a first-time investment in childcare that guarantees that its cost will not exceed 7% of their income. And I am so proud that this package also includes paid family and medical leave, which finally responds to the needs of workers and families so that they can take time to care for themselves or for their loved one. We have an opportunity to build the architecture for the future for working families. Working in middle-class families across the country are counting on us to build a better, stronger America. With that, let me thank you again for this honor and just say to please always remember that Congress is an institution that responds to external pressure. So tell all the advocates out there to please continue to stand up and speak out. Your voices will be heard. Together, I know we can get this done. Thank you, Congresswoman DeLauro. What a powerful advocate to an inspiration to have uh, the people on this um, who came from the White House, to have Representative DeLauro, Senator Young, people who, who really are our public servants and uh, working with us. So we're very grateful. We will be sure to tell uh, Representative DeLauro about how many lobby visits we had today, because I'm sure she'll be thrilled to hear how many people were on the Hill talking about Build Back Better and these provisions. Um, Jim, it's been a long day of lobbying, and I'm going to turn it back to you to wrap our program up tonight. Um, and I know you're going to give us a little bit of a forecast of what's to come tomorrow. So let me just say thank you to all of you who are with us right now, who have joined us in lobbying. It is a uh, uh, it's Jim's favorite day, and it's also my favorite day to know how many people we've had uh, talking about this issue, because it really is uh, what is going to make a difference. So thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Diane. And uh, what a what a just a perfect we were expecting Rosa DeLauro yesterday, but in some sense, she just affirmed all of the work that you all have done around the country. 
this is the work that's going to make change in Washington and is so, so important. And and before I go into tomorrow's schedule, I also want to come back to another part of the work that really makes this possible. And that is your financial support for FCNL. You can you all play a key role. And I and I said this, I think, in the opening session, you all play a key role in both the advocacy that we do and in sustaining the financial health of the organization. And we've set a goal of finding 25 new monthly sustainers for FCNL. And I know that when I checked with our development team, they said, so far, one of you has signed up to be a monthly sustainer. So only 24 more to go. Uh, I know that there's so many of you out there already who provide just a lot of financial support to this work. And I just want to encourage those of you who can, whatever you could give to become a monthly sustainer. It is one of the best ways to really sustain the organization and provide us with a regular flow of financial support. And with that, I want to just say also, this will be the end of our programming this evening, but we'll be back tomorrow. And tomorrow we get started with Coffee with Friends. This is, as I've said, my second favorite, most favorite part of the of the meeting is getting a chance to really be with all of you and casually have conversation. And then at noon Eastern time, this is always my challenge, nine o'clock California time, eight o'clock uh, Alaska time, and 7 a.m. Hawaii time. Sorry, friends in Hawaii for getting you started so early. We have Lunch with Leadership. This is a chance to hear from some of the other leaders of the organization. And to get a chance, we'll go into breakout rooms and learn more about what different parts, how different parts of the organization work. And then we're coming back for what I think will be one of the most interesting parts of the programming, which is looking towards 2022. This is today you heard from the lobbyists about what they're doing now. Tomorrow, they're all getting out their crystal balls. And they're going to talk to us about what we think is on the agenda for 2022. What's the potential for making change? And then Annie, who you've met before over at YouTube Central, has set up the next part is a scavenger hunt. Then we have some other programming. And one of the highlights, probably the biggest highlight this year of our programming is our opening annual meeting address our keynote address with Vanessa July. This is at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And we'll have a chance. We, we know that Vanessa's message is so important. We'll have a chance after that to be in worship sharing by affinity groups to talk about that important message and some of the queries that come out of that message. So that's our programming for tomorrow. Thank you all for all of the work that you did today. It is really what makes such a difference to the change that all of us are trying to make. And see you tomorrow.